Well, good morning, church family. What a privilege it is to be here with you today. And um, I, um, I know that that was a little bit heavy, but my prayer is that we can move now from understanding where our needs are. And today I want to talk to you about what's to come and what God has actually called and is calling us to do. Now, today I named this message of our series of favorites, Your Role is Big. Now, as Ray is on holidays, uh, Chris, I know he's here somewhere. He said last week that Ray has asked a heap of retreads to preach. And I'm like, what? I thought for Mitch and for me, how can he call us retreads? I'm only a young whippersnapper. But anyway, moving on. So Ray's on holidays and he asks us to preach into our favorite subject. Now, sometimes when we hear this idea where a topic in a sermon has the word you and what you have to play, we sometimes become a little bit, oh, here we go again. Where's Jesus in this? How does Jesus play out? But you just want to talk about us. And what I want to say to you today is that that's not the case. So look past this, because I truly believe that we have a big role. Why do I say this? Why uh, do I want to preach on this when I have the opportunity of preaching on the most special? And it's because this has been fundamental in me realizing my role in the church, in the way he could use me. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you a story. I've probably told it four, four or five years ago, but I'll, I'll tell you again about myself. I, um, as you know, grew up in, uh, well, in Jinjin, and then when I was six years old, we uh, went to Colombia. Um, and now I'll, I want to say something there. All the staff tease me because they say, oh, you always say Colombia, and uh, like you say it different. It's Colombia because it's an O, not a U. So it's Colombia is in America. Colombia is the country. There we are. I win. Um, <laughs> um, I, I can win because you can't answer back. Um, so I grew up, um, I, my parents are missionaries in Colombia, and so I went over there. Now, when I was six years old, my parents decided they wanted to make sure that English was something that we learned and it was our first language. And so uh, we decided to do homeschooling. Now, homeschooling is really good for some kids, but not for me. I'm quite, uh, as a young kid, I was quite hy hyperactive, and I loved playing soccer or football, and I loved being outside, and I loved playing with my friends, and I loved making random noises down the hallway at five in the morning, and I just loved um, being active. See, I had four, uh, three siblings that they did okay with homeschooling, but for me, the youngest, it was really, really hard. All I wanted to do was speak Spanish. This English rubbish, when am I ever going to use it ever again? So schooling was really not my priority. Now, that had an effect, a big effect. The effect was that all the fundamentals on reading and spelling were not there. Also, I found a way of making sure that my mum was driven to the wall or driven crazy because I would do everything I could to get out of it, leading to my mother, I'm sure, having a mental breakdown. That was okay growing up. I could get away with it because I was this random Australian kid in a third world country and everyone wanted to be his friends. But when I moved here to Australia and I got an apprenticeship, it became very evident that not being able to read or write very well was a big issue. Thankfully, God provided. I got an apprenticeship, and I don't know how I made my way through without having good language. Uh, when I came to Australia, I couldn't speak English very well, and um, it, was, it was a struggle. After moving through my trade and finishing my apprenticeship, I got a job, and working in different areas, I quickly moved up the management chain, but over and over and again got demoted because of my writing and, and spelling. It hurt. It was embarrassing. I think it hit rock bottom when I worked for a company called Hastings Deering, and they called me into the office to have a talk to me, and they said, Leighton, 
we want to pay for you to go and do reading and writing lessons. It really hurt. It really hurt. It was embarrassing. How could God use someone who is missing some basic qualities that you need in this society? God um, began to um, call us, Merrin and myself, into ministry. And as he was doing that, we were called to a campsite here in Harvey Bay called Camp Payalba. At Camp Payalba, we spent two years. And during that time, it was just a good time of learning. But there was a learning in that. And it's that God had called us into ministry, but he had called us to Camp Payalba for a short period. As I was praying about what that would look like, I was praying um, in the bathroom at Camp Palba, the ladies' bathroom. Camp wasn't on. There was no ladies there. I was cleaning it. Um, (laughs) And I was cleaning the bathroom, and I was reading and listening because God has gifted us with technology that reads to us, and I was listening to Philippians. And last week, Chris spoke about how the Word of God grabs you sometimes and speaks you in a way that never before. And it's so, so loud and so vibrant that you kind of go, whoa, what? How did I miss that? And this was the verse. And it was in relation to praying for this church because Rhea Rosa had left as pastor and we were in deep need for another pastor to come on board. And it said this, Philippians 2, 13. For God is working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. (laughs) It was like at that moment, all these embarrassments, all this shame around what I couldn't do was, was put aside with this idea that God is actually working through me and he is putting desires in my heart. He is giving me everything I need so that I have the power to do what pleases him. And I can focus on what I couldn't do or I could focus on what he can do. And so five years later, I had the privilege of being here with you, of serving alongside many of you. The young adults have running jokes about my spelling but I love them. (laughs) Um, And I'm sure that if you've ever received an email from me, if it hasn't been spell-checked by Nicole, my favorite spell-checker, and there's spelling mistakes there, then you will know that it's come from me. But I just want to say to you today, I want to talk about something that I think we're missing See, so many times we sit in church, and I do the same thing. I sit there and I look at the pulpit, and I look at who's doing things, and I look at the people that have this knowledge, and I think to myself, man, I wish I was like them. Why can't I be like them? If I was just like them, I could do. Missing the fact that God has designed me with so many weaknesses, not just reading and writing, but that he has put people around me to be able to do his work, and it's the same for you. We need to stop. We need to listen. We need to see how God is using each one of us. So I want to move to 1 Corinthians 12. Because I love stories, as you know, and I love using pictures to describe things. And this chapter uses a beautiful picture about the body of Christ. And so I'm going to go through this, and I think it, it's quite self-explanatory. Explanatory? Yeah? Something like that. And I think it explains itself well. Let's put it that way. Um. So I'm just going to go through, as we go through these verses, and I'm just going to give you running commentary, some ideas that I want you and us to think about today. So here we go in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 and 2, moving on from there. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding the question about special abilities the Spirit gives us, just pause here. Why? I want you to notice that Paul is writing to the Corinth church, This church is a port city. 
It's a city that has great wealth, that has a lot of worship of idols. But also, I want you to see here that this book, 1 Corinthians, is actually not the first letter from Paul to the Corinth church. There is actually a 1 Corinthians. This would be 2 Corinthians. Corinthians 2 would be 3 Corinthians. And there is a 4 Corinthians that was lost and didn't make it into the Bible. So what we are seeing here in this chapter is Paul speaking to them as if it was a one-way conversation. It's like we're sitting here and we're reading this and we're just hearing only what Paul's saying, but that yet they're asking him questions. If we look throughout, I think it's seven, it talks about sexuality and other chapters, he says the same thing. It is clear that the Corinth church is asking questions. There's a dialogue happening about what is wrong and what is right. This church was struggling to understand how culture fit in, how the spiritual things from the, the temples um, were fit into what they did. And so he's talking to them regarding something that they're having issues with. And then he says, I don't want you to misunderstand this. So he's really calling them, get this, guys. Don't miss this. And I want to say today, church, let's not miss this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray, swept along in the worship of speechless idols. It's like he's talking to them a little bit like, come on, guys. You knew that you worshipped dead gods. You knew you worshipped these gods who, who have no real speech, who are just objects. Now you worship the one, only, the living God. So he goes on to say, I want you to know that no one speaks by the Spirit of God will cross curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of all of them. Where is he going with this? Well, Paul, they had an issue, and the issue was that one of the temples worshipped there, they would worship, and as they would worship, they would lose control of their speech and speak in gibberish. Now, as the Spirit comes and fills the Corinth church, tongues is a practice gift, and there was, a, there was something happening around the hierarchy of how Christian you actually are. We see this sometimes in our own church. Oh, you don't speak in tongues? Huh. Well... Keep asking because one day you'll be as spiritual as I. That is, seriously, that is what they were dealing with. And he is saying to them here, hey, first of all, if someone declares that Jesus is, well, second, sorry, first of all, no one can curse who Jesus is. It, it just, you cannot be a son of God if you're cursing. So men were coming and they were saying, I'm speaking in tongues, I'm doing these things. And then they were cursing the name of Jesus. And it's like, no, 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 that can't be right. That's not the right spirit. And then he says, except by the, uh, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now let's not, it's not that you just declare it, it's that you mean it. No one can mean it. No one can really, really know it except through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to speak. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Do you see that he's starting to talk about the equality of the body? He's starting to talk about, hey guys, let's cut this idea of one being better, one having more, one being more important. Because it is God who decides. God himself works in different ways. And the gifts have been given to each one of us. When we ask Jesus into our heart, he gifts us, he gives us gifts to do his work. 
so that we can help each other, so that we can complement each other. In other words, God's intention was that we weren't all the same, that we all didn't look the same, yet that we used the difference that we are, the differentness of what we are for his glory. We move on, verse 8 and onwards. To one person, the Spirit gave the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gave a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gave uh, gave great faith to another. And to someone else, the Spirit gave the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages whilst another is given the ability to interpret them. Here we see a a number of gifts that people are given. This is not all of them. If you read through um, Ephesians, Romans, and um, there's a couple of single standing ones uh, throughout there, there's around, some people would say, 18 to um, 22 gifts. These were only a few. But what he's saying here is, I want you to notice this. He is saying, hey, it's the same God. The one God that is gifted each one differently, but it is God doing the work. And then it says in 11, it is the one and only spirit who distributes all gifts, all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. It's not that we can work our way to being the super spiritual that has the super cool gifts. It is God working in us, preparing us. It is God, and I love this description of what a spiritual gift is. It is being able to do something supernaturally, supernaturally more than we could do in our own abilities. It's not that we're just these guys. It's actually that in our own abilities, God's Spirit steps in and does the work, and it is more than we could ever do in our own strength. That is the gift. That is what God has given each one of you who have called on the name of Jesus. And in verse 12, It begins this conversation around the body. And I love this picture. I think it explains it so, so well. And in a way, Paul's being a little bit facetious. You know, he's kind of being a bit sarcastic and kind of using an obvious example to, to get us to see just how wrong we may have it. And he says this, the human body has many parts, but many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles and some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into the one body by the one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. It's not another spirit working. It is the same spirit. And I want you to notice, Paul just repeats himself over and over again in this passage. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If the foot said, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an ear, I, sorry, Would that make it any less a part of the body? If the body were an eye, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But but our body has many parts, and God has put each part just 
where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. <laughs> you know the ad on TV? I think it's one of the allergy medication and it's like a, a nose walking around. Like, how weird would that be? Yet we think that that's, the, we kind of have convinced ourselves that that's the way the church sometimes should be. That we all need to be evangelists or we all need to be teachers or we all need to have the gift of mercy or we need, all need to have the gift of hospitality. Maybe we all need to be discerning perfectly all the time. We all need to speak in tongues or we all need to prophesy. That is not how we have been created. That is not God's intention for the church. Yes, we are all called to evangelize. We are all called to be discerning. But we are not all gifted. So, and I just want to say, You may be sitting here, maybe for a long period in your life, or maybe not, you've thought to yourself, I wish I could just, if I could learn more about the Bible, I could bring more people to Christ. Or if I just bring my friends to the church, they will hear the gospel, and finally they will know. Because I can't, I don't know enough. Or maybe you're thinking, oh man, my work colleague just annoys me. Because every time he walks into the room, he'll walk up to someone and say, hey, do you, you know, are you religious? And then he starts this conversation that all of a sudden these people are, are giving their life to Christ. What's going on? He does it all the time. He makes me feel guilty. Well, he has the spiritual gift of evangelism. God has gifted him in that role. We don't need to be comparing ourselves all the time. And this is what we're getting to, trying to be what we're not meant to be yet realizing that we are gifted to complement and to work together. Then he says, verse 20, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. I want to read that again. I want to read that again because I I just want to make sure we get this. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. As I think about our bodies, I think about our heart, our lungs, our organs. You know, what, what happens with them? Where well, they're protected by, by, um, by a rib cage and by muscles and, and our brain has this big, hard thing around it protecting it because it is in itself weak. But when it's a part of the body, it is extremely necessary and strong. Maybe you think that you're weak and that you don't have anything to offer. Do you realize that you may be the most necessary? Then he goes on and says in 23, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with greatest care So we carefully protect these parts that should not be seen. Whilst the more honorable parts do not require this special care, so God has put the body together such that extra honor and care can be given to those parts with less dignity. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about when I used to play soccer or football. And um, what do you do when you line up for a free kick and you're on the wall, right? You're waiting for that ball to come and you're protecting yourself. Why is the hand here? I won't explain why the hand's down there. Why is the hand here? Um, 
is because it wants to protect your chest, this area. It wants to be able to move quickly, and it wants to protect your face. Now, our hands are so important, right? The hands are what we grab things, we eat with uh, our arms, we can lift, we're strong. They are so important to us. But yet these parts of the body at that moment are putting themselves in harm way to protect the other parts that cannot protect themselves. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about you who are here and say, yeah, but Leighton, my mental illness is just drive me up the wall. Like I, I honestly do not know how I could be used ever by God with what goes on in my head. And what's maybe you're sitting here and saying, my anxiety is driving me to a point where I can't even do anything right. Or maybe you're thinking, hey, do you know how sick I am? And you're saying to me that I can do? Or maybe you're sitting here saying, you know, the past has broken me and I can be good for nothing. Maybe you're thinking, you know what, my legs don't even work anymore. Maybe you're saying I'm missing a part of my body and it's making me less effective and less valuable to the body of Christ. That is not what this says. God knows where you're at. God knows what you're going through. In fact, he has placed you and gifted you in a way that you can be used by him in your weakness. In fact, he has put people around you to protect and care for you. That is the role of of the body. Well, I'll speak to those who seem to be limbs and arms and legs and the more important parts. The ones that are more obvious, the boisterous ones and maybe not the boisterous ones. Do you realize that part of your role is to protect? Do you realize that part of your role is to be there for those people to care for them? That is how God has designed you, designed us. And then he says this, 25 and 20 to 27, this makes for harmony amongst the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honoured, all parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. We are all, you can look around this room and realize that we, all of us, doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you're at, it doesn't matter your health, mental um, history, it does not matter. You are a part of this body. And as I thought about this, why it means so much to me. It means so much to me because even though I have to rehearse 30 times a passage so I can read it somewhat well, And I have to get everything spell checked. I would not change it for the world. I would not, genuinely, I would not want to go back and do better at school. <laughs> I, I probably should have, but um, but I don't. I don't want to change that. I don't want to change that moment that I walked into my boss's office and he said, Leighton. We need to send you to reading and writing classes. Because in ministry, every single day, it reminds me that I need you. 
every day. Every day, I walk into the office and I look at every single staff member who I have the privilege of working with and I think to myself, I need you. I cannot do it without you. Every time that I look at our young adult leaders and what God is doing in that space, I look at the amazing things they are doing and instead of comparing myself, all I can think of, man, I need you guys, desperately need you guys with me. Every time I look at what Colleen and Rachel and the kids team is doing, I remind myself the fact that I am unable to do it on my own and I desperately need them. Every time I think about the youth, is the same. Every time I think about the junior leaders we shared last week, I look at these guys and they're not a commodity. We desperately need young men and women who love God and who want to learn and grow, and I need them. And I need them because God has put them here. God has put them around me. There's two statements I want you to go away with today. It's two the truths that I want you to go away with today. And the first one is, God has not called a few. He has called us all. Remember that, guys. If you think that you haven't been called and like others, wrong, straight from the mouth of, of Satan himself, we have all been called. Secondly, you are not like others. You are perfectly designed for the role God has for you. What would it look like if we lived knowing that as a church? What would our finances look like? If we realize that it's actually a responsibility of all of us. What if we changed our mind around being better, but around supporting each other, realizing that God has gifted you and equipped you for his work and your weakness? See, if there's one thing I have come to learn is that I am at my best when I am a part of the body. it's the same for you. If you think that you need to separate yourself from the body, nothing good will come. You need those around you because it's complementary and God continually works in this way and it's what he has called us to do. And we are called to be obedient and not to have the answers. So church family, we are family. We are family. And I want to see each one of us. I don't want to see us being the best, biggest church in Harvey Bay. I want us to be known for being the most obedient church in Harvey Bay. Where each one of us are obedient to where God is working and encouraging and moving us to. That we complement each other. And so I want to invite you, and we're going to move to communion now. If you have uh, a little cup with uh, a wafer,